the assembly um, to order and ask you to stand with me and pledge the allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Richard Anderson? Here. Ronald Bergstrom? Here. Mark Boardman? Here. George Bryant? Present. Fred Penland? Here. Dennis Fonseca? Here. Raymond Gottwald? Here. Marsha King? Sheila Lyons? Thomas Lynch? Here. John Oman? Anthony Scalise? Here. Fred Schilp? Charlotte Striebel? Here. Julia Taylor? Here. Madam Speaker, we have a quorum with 84.8% of the delegates present. Thank you. May I ha uh, unless there are any changes that anybody sees on the calendar of business, may I have a vote to uh, accept it as presented? Uh, Madam Speaker, I move approval of the calendar of business. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? All right. All right. Thank you. Um, the approval of the journal of April 4th, if there are, I have one, one correction myself. Um, I called the meeting to order at 4.45 p.m., not at 4 o'clock. So that was the, the public hearing, and so we were late getting started. Uh, that's my correction. Um, does anybody else have any um, corrections? Uh, hearing none, I would ask for a motion to accept uh, the uh, journal. Uh, Madam Speaker, with your correction, I move approval of the journal of April 4th, 2007. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Oh, the commissioners are, will, will um, with your um, approval, will um, skip over the commissioners for a moment. I know they are coming because I just left them a few minutes ago. And um, we'll go um, right to the 21st Century Report. Uh, Marco Fenn is here to uh, give us a report. And I believe that you all have received um, a copy of the overview of the Cape Cod Commission dated 41807. That is what Marco will be speaking about today. Welcome, Marco. Nice to see you again. What was it, five minutes ago <laughs> that we were together? Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. This microphone seems very loud to me, but does it sound all right? Yeah, it's fine. It's a little yeah. echoey. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to be here to um, give you all an update on um, what we've been doing to uh, follow through on the recommendations of the 21st Century Task Force. Um, as you will recall, the, the task force um, made its uh, final report to the county commissioners in um, early December. And since that time, the commission has had a, uh, a steering committee that, that has been working to um, um, oversee uh, follow through on on the individual recommendations and um, we've also been meeting with other community groups as well as as the county commissioners to discuss what should be priorities and um, um, how to, to best organize this to, to get it done in a, in a timely way um, the uh, it I want to go over this. I've, I've given you an outline here, which um, I've used um, a number of times to um, go out and talk to community groups about this, and it's going to change a little bit as we as we go along. Um, but um, there are there are three broad themes that that came out of the task force um, report. Um, the first being that we, that we really needed to, to build better communication and coordination with, with our 15 Cape Towns. Um, secondly, that we needed to put more emphasis on the planning and technical services that the Commission provides to the towns. And third, that um, they wanted us to try to make our regulatory process um, more transparent, more predictable, more, more user friendly. And a lot of the recommendations relate to that. Um, we've um, uh, as I said, we've had a, a steering committee that's made up of both commission members and commission staff um, that have been working on this for several months now. Um, 
We've um, also set up a, a, a series of in-house working groups to work on the spe some of the spe specific tasks that I'm going to go through here. Um, and we're anticipating as well that we're, we're going to be consulting um, some uh, advisors that um, include former um, app DRI applicants, um, their consultants, town officials, um, and so forth to help us as we're, as we're drafting proposed changes to try to get some feedback from, from those folks. So let me run through quickly. There, there's sort of three uh, broad areas um, of, of recommendations. First, dealing with planning. Second, dealing with regulation. And third, dealing with, with communication and coordination. Um, and I'll give you some of the highlights of the, of the things that we're working on. Um, one of the main recommendations that the task force made was that they wanted um, all of our planning and regulation to be more map-based. They wanted to have a, a regional vision of what land use, um, future land use should be on Cape Cod and to try to tie our regulations to that in a way that encourages growth to go to the right places. And so um, for, the, for several months we've been working with a town planners group to try to come up with um, a way to categorize different types of land uses, um, both in terms of what's there today, but also in terms of what we'd like to see in the future. And we're going to be um, doing a series of mapping workshops with each of the 15 towns. We, we had the first one actually um, week before last in the town of East Ham. And those mapping workshops are really to identify where are the regional economic centers, where are our village highway and industrial redevelopment areas, and where are the areas that, that require resource protection, whether those are sensitive natural resource areas, historic districts, those kinds of things. And the maps will be used um, to both uh, refine the level of commission review in different locations across the Cape. And we're anticipating that there would probably be different thresholds and, and standards in those areas. And um, as well as to identify local zoning changes that might be needed for the towns to um, achieve their local vision of what they'd like to see. And of course, one of the things we're trying to encourage is some cross-town um, interaction in these, in these town uh, mapping workshops so that we're thinking beyond town, town boundaries as, as we put together the regional map. Um, related to that is, is a housing needs study that the, that the task force called for, um, trying to identify in a much more specific way um, the types of housing that are needed, the, the number of units, the price ranges in each of the towns, um, and to try to identify locations where that housing could actually go. Um, so that will be very closely related to, to the mapping project. Um, in the mapping workshops, we're, we're asking people a series of questions. Um, where do you anticipate you're going to be providing uh, wastewater treatment? Therefore, you know, where are the, the, the locations where you could have higher density development, allow for affordable housing, and so forth? Um, we're in the process of rewriting the regional policy plan. This is the year for the five-year update of the regional plan. And the task force has asked us to make some very substantial changes in, in the regional plan. Um, first and foremost, to try to reorganize it so that we're, we really separate out the planning and regulatory elements of the plan. Um, they're mixed together in the current plan, and I think they found that that, that has caused some confusion in the past. Um, they want us to try to restructure um, the mitigation requirements um, and tie that um, again to the maps. So for example, the standards might be different in different locations. Um, if you're in a growth center, you, ma you might not need to provide um, an open space set aside, whereas if you're in a significant natural resource area, you would. Um, they also wanted us to try to restructure how we require mitigation um, to try to make that, that process more predictable for, for applicants coming into the process um, and to make it, make it faster. Um, so for example, instead of having to do a detailed traffic study for every project that comes before the commission, we're trying to um, develop a mitigation schedule that relates to the trip generation of different types of uses so that people could get an idea of what, it's, what is it going to cost them. And if they don't want to go through a detailed traffic study, they could simply um, pay into a mitigation fund for that town to um, use those funds for, for needed improvements, whether that's roadway improvements or transit or bike paths, sidewalks, that kind of thing. Um, they also asked us to um, identify potential areas for regional districts of critical planning concern. We've 
you know, um, been through a number of DCPC nominations here at the assembly. Um, they wanted us to look across town lines in consultation with the towns and um, in the RPP to make some recommendations about potential areas that, that might um, be able to use that tool. And they also wanted us to include in the plan uh, a new section that, that creates uh, a way of sort of measuring progress against the goals. We set out these goals for, for um, all the different subject areas in the regional plan. How can we measure whether we're, we're achieving those goals over time? In the area of regulation, um, we spent a lot of time um, with the task force talking about the thresholds for the commission's review. And I think this is a, a subject that, that many people um, uh, have an interest in, and um, it's an area that I think we're going to see some s quite substantial changes. Um, as you know, right now our um, our thresholds are uniform across Cape Cod, no matter where you are, um, what town you're in, what kind of a location you're in, the thresholds are the same. And um, the task force really wanted us to refine those thresholds to make it easier to develop in, in designated growth centers and make it more difficult to develop in places where we don't want to see development, like in, in sensitive resource areas. So um, there are a variety of different kinds of changes that, that we're considering, and, and some of them are, are laid out here in your handout. I won't go, go through them in, in, in detail. Um, but uh, this is... Um, this is part of our regulations, um, and it will require coming back to the assembly um, to, to make these modifications, but we're hoping to tie it to these new map zones that will be created in the regional policy plan update. So the regional plan and the enabling regulations, the thresholds, have to, have to fit together. Um, they've also asked us to create a limited scope DRI review process. This is um, a way where when a project um, comes through the door, we can do an initial scoping process and determine what are the areas that it needs to be reviewed for. So, um, you know, there's some dozen different subject areas that the regional plan covers today, you know, starting with water resources and coastal resources and wetlands and wildlife and affordable housing and economic development, transportation, and so forth. Um, oftentimes we'll get a project that may have regional impacts in one, two, three of those areas, but not all of them. And so this would allow us to narrow the scope of the review and focus only on those things that are really of greatest concern and allow the process to be faster um, and uh, less expensive for uh, project proponents. They've also asked us to look into establishing a joint review process with, with um, some of the towns. Um, and um, we've been We've been working to basically um, lay out sort of a menu of possible uh, levels of involvement between commission and town review. And uh, we've had a, a couple of discussions with the town planners group about this, how it might work. Um, we're going to be going to the town managers association um, uh, in a, a little over a month to talk to them about it. There's some legal issues with trying to merge our process with, with local permitting, and it's actually quite a complicated subject. But what we're hoping to do is to give the towns a menu of options that they can choose from. And through a mem memorandum of understanding with each town, we could establish how will we interact around regulatory matters. And um, they can opt in a, at whatever level they think um, is, is a good fit for, for their town. So I anticipate it's probably going to be different in different towns. Um, We've also been asked to make um, more use of some of the existing tools that we have for pre-permitting um, development sites. Um, and this includes growth incentive zones, like the, uh, the one that we approved for downtown Hyannis last year, um, as well as use of development agreements, which is a form of contract zoning, which allows you to sit down with a, a development team in a town and basically negotiate the terms of uh, development for a particular site. Um, We've got um, a number of projects in the pipeline for this. Um, there's been interest in doing uh, growth incentive zones in Buzzards Bay and in Dennisport, uh, potentially in East Harwich. Um, we're, we've also been talking to the town of Yarmouth uh, about um, doing a very uh, focused growth incentive zone to deal with um, a very specific issue in the Route 28 corridor dealing with the redevelopment of motel and hotel properties um, along Route 28. Um, we've been talking to the town of Mashpee, I mean, sorry, the town of Sandwich about uh, possibly doing a development agreement 
for um, the South Sandwich Triangle area, which is an area where the town owns a parcel of land that they want to see uh, developed in, in a mixed-use project. want to see if we can tie it together with some of the um, adjoining properties and come up with a plan that will create some good economic development for the town and, and, and perhaps could be a model for, for similar types of developments elsewhere on the Cape. Um, there are also a number of procedural uh, changes that the task force recommended in terms of project scheduling, meeting notes. These are things that don't, don't necessarily require any um, uh, regulatory changes, but are procedural changes that we can do in-house, and a number of these things are already underway. Um, one specific thing that they wanted us to do was to do some follow-up that um, it was in their report it was called a post-mortem which none of us like that term because um, it implies that something's dead and that's not really where we wanted to end up um, but a follow-up survey um, with uh, DRI applicants to, to talk about what went right, what went wrong during the course of the process of review, what changes might we make to address the problems that, that, that did arise so that we're getting a, a, a regular feedback loop um, of information um, from applicants so that we can be fine-tuning our process as we go along. And uh, we've actually been working on um, a series of questions and a process for, for um, doing that, and we're hoping to test that soon with some former applicants. And then the final area deals with communication and coordination with towns, which I, I think is probably the single most important um, piece of all of this. Um, the building a stronger relationship with the towns, I think, is really critical to, to making um, all of this work. Um, we're, there's some very specific things here, like annual meetings with boards of selectmen, and, and we've been going around and, and giving updates like this to a number of the, the different boards of selectmen. I was in Dennis last night. We were in Sandwich a couple of weeks ago, um, and we will continue to do that. We'll be going around to, to each of the towns. Um, we've redesigned our website to try to make it more user friendly. Um, and if you if you look at the website, you'll find now that I think it is easier to navigate. There's a lot more information um, on it. We're, we're going to try to include more mapping resources on the website. And we're hoping to be able to add a search function that, that will make it easier for people to get to exactly the information they're looking for. Um, one specific thing is we've put um, a page on the website that deals with the task force uh, recommendations and we'll be providing updates on that page on the things that, that we're working on. Um, we're also um, trying to have more regular meetings with town regulatory staff, um, town managers, planners, engineers, economic and housing officials in the towns. Um, we've, we've had a relationship during the last year or so with the town of Barnstable's growth management department, which has proved to be very fruitful. Um, we meet with them monthly, and um, it's amazing the number of things that we have to talk about. Um, sometimes it's specific projects that we're reviewing, sometimes it's planning studies that we're working on, there are lots of different things, but it's, it's given us um, an opportunity to explore together how we can help each other out. And um, we're, we're um, starting to do that on a more regular basis with some of the other towns, and I think it's, it's, it's a very fruitful thing to do. Um, also, talking about things like speakers bureaus to get more information out about some of the non-regulatory work that the commission does. Um, training programs and, and, and continuing to host some of the roundtables um, uh, meetings of, of key groups that, that um, uh, relate to the work that we do, like the town planners group, our community preservation committees, um, the historic commissions. Um, we have a GIS users group. This is an opportunity for town officials who work in these various different areas to get together periodically. Um, we try to host it um, and, and give them a chance to talk to each other about um, things of common interest. So, um, and, and we also, um, uh, we're, we're hoping to get greater participation in the Cape Cod um, uh, Selectmen and Counselors Association by the officers of the, of the Cape Cod Commission so that they would have an, a regular opportunity to interact with the selectmen from, from the, um, and the town counselors from the towns. Um, we um, anticipate that you're going to be getting um, uh, uh, some uh, direction from the county commissioners um, in the near future uh, on their priorities. Um, we're doing outreach with towns and chambers. Um, 
much, much of the changes that we need to make will have to come back through you, um, uh, either uh, e with changes to our enabling regulations or the, uh, the, the regional plan update. We anticipate that there are going to be public hearings both at the commission level. There will have to be public hearings here. Um, Charlotte has s expressed some interest in trying to move those public hearings around to different parts of the Cape so that, so that we make them accessible to, to folks from um, all different towns. So we've got, um, you know, I think a lot of work ahead of us, but um, some very creative um, um, stuff in, in process, and we're pretty excited about it. So that's that's a quick overview and I'd be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Margot. I appreciate your coming over today and um, giving the assembly um, an update on what's happening. Um, questions uh, from the members um, to Margot? Tom? Uh, that's an exhaustive delineation of things to do, and you certainly, as you point out, have your work you know, cut out for you. And it seems like you'll be addressing the 21st Century Task Force uh, concerns. Yama taking a first step in voting out of the commission. If you were successful in implementing all of these things, do they address the concerns that you heard from Yarmouth when and, and those that want out? Does this address what their concerns are in your in your view or not? Um, I think that all of the concerns that have been articulated by the Yarmouth Selectmen um, are contained in the the recommendations of the task force. Um, whether they will be satisfied with with the, the you know the final product I think remains to be seen and there's you know there's going to be a public process that People are going to have to debate about how far do we go and what kinds of changes do we make. So it's, it's hard to know whether they'll be satisfied at the end of the process. We're certainly going to listen very carefully to their input, um, but there are lots of other people who have um, input to give as well. Has your litigation slowed down, stayed the same, or um, what's, what's the status of those that might be appealing projects in different, in different ways? Um, in general, I would say actually that the, the litigation has slowed down. Um, we've had a couple of kind of wacky um, uh, cases that we've been able to get rid of fairly quickly that really didn't have a whole lot to do with us. Um, a, a recent example is that the uh, Wendy's um, restaurant adjacent to the Barnstable Municipal Airport um, they came came forward after about a month after the airport decision was rendered, with uh, hit us in the airport with a suit um, because they were unhappy about a one-way arrow that showed on the on the road plans for the roadway improvements as part of that project. Now, they never came forward during the review process. This issue was never raised. Frankly, I think it's a very simple thing that we can probably settle, but that kind of thing does kind of come out of left field sometimes, mm -hmm. and we just have to deal with them as they come up. Um, we don't have very many active lawsuits at the moment, though. Can, can mm -hmm. I interject, Madam mm -hmm. Speaker? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Actually, along that Say on. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, we actually held a litigation management meeting uh, early March, I think, or in March, and we had the uh, chief underwriter from Maya, the insurance company, attend. And I think he was duly impressed, not with me, but I think with the Cape Cod Commission uh, staff attorney. And so we're going to be pushing Maya to fold the commission back under our regular public officials policy, where. Um, it's basically first dollar coverage. Right now they're on the 50-50. So, um, so I think that shows that um, um, the litigation management efforts have helped. And uh, I think, you know, as Margo said, you all, they're all wacky, of course. Um, but um, you, know, you do get these and you can't prevent them, but uh, we can work to try to mitigate uh, the costs associated with them. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other, George? On the uh, litigation, uh, presumably you, uh, there's a limit to the amount of insurance you can carry. That's uh, are you still insured for? 
there's never a limit to the amount of insurance you can carry. There's only a limit to the amount you can afford. That's really what it is. Um, the commission on the first million dollars of coverage, which is um, uh, fully covered under our regular uh, public officials policy, is 50-50. But above that, up to five million, which is our excess liability policy, they're covered at the regular at the regular rate. But it's always the first few dollars that come out of pocket that hurt. I see. I remember when the community of Jesus uh, was involved with the Cape Cod Commission when they were building their basilica, or pl uh, planned a very large basilica in Orleans. I think the bill came to $600,000. Uh, I, I don't remember the specifics of that, George, but it was, it was a big lawsuit at the time. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, think, I think we've gotten both more, more skillful at um, crafting our decisions and also more skillful at defending them um, yeah. over the years. So, yeah. it, it, and once you have some established case law um, um, based on the you know the body of, of law, the Cape Cod Commission Act, it tends over time to discourage suits because it's been tested, and and the court has ruled one way or the other. Uh, one other question. You go to, uh, Margaret, you go to all or nearly all of the, the formal commission meetings, do you not? Yes. Um, has anyone ever uh, on the commission, the people who are appointed by the towns, have they ever uh, had to stand down because of a conflict of interest? Yes, there, there, have, been in, there have been instances where people have had to recuse themselves. Frequent? Not very frequent, but no. it happens from time to time. One of the things that's always concerned me, and I've mentioned to you, this to you before, is that uh, the people on the commission, because they're neither paid nor elected, do not have to file a statement of fi financial interest like we all do, and presumably the commissioners, and I would imagine you do. I do, yeah. And um, uh, someone uh, might be able to successfully conceal um, their interest in, in a project or, their, lack, or, or uh, their interest in someone else's uh, project if uh, they did not come forward. Uh, since they do not have to file a statement of financial interest, as we will all have to in another five weeks, uh, there's no way of really knowing whether they, they have an interest, maybe in an adjoining property, maybe in a similar business, uh, who knows what. But. I, know, um, I, know. I think people have been have been quite conscientious about you know um, coming forward if if there was if the there was any any know. potential conflict. We don't know. Well, you know, Cape Cod's kind of a small town, and people find out about things. So I, I, I'm 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 not. I'm not concerned about it. I think I think that 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 people are are conducting themselves honorably here. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Fred. Um, the Cape Cod Commission Act, which actually brought you into existence, the changes that you contemplate or the changes that are being considered, would that require any changes in the Cape Cod Commission Act? In other words, it would have to go to Boston. Not at this time. Um, the, the, uh, the package of recommendations that we're working on um, are all changes that can be approved through this body. Any other questions, Fred? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, um, Margo, uh, we talked a little bit uh, when we were meet, met with you a couple of weeks ago about some of the historical aspects of the Cape Cod Commission, and I guess that relates to the 21st Century Task Force. But I was just looking at some of what you, you had uh, beautifully gone through here this afternoon. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, a lot of the reasons that the Cape Cod Commission was formed, um, and I think maybe most important was natural resources, um, and, and that really hasn't changed a whole lot in terms of uh, uh, the extent to which we are trying to preserve what we have here. And I think, and, and, and also the quality of the water here, uh, and the shape of the Cape in terms of its limitations of transportation and ability to have traffic flow through the Cape. But one of the things that seems to have changed a lot is the economy here, particularly related to the inability of 
uh, many working class people to get, be able to get housing over the last 15 years. And uh, how has that, that particular area ch changed and evolved and how has the commission evolved to kind of meet that demand and that challenge? Well, there, there are a couple of different things. Um, one is that I, I think that th there's going to be a much stronger emphasis in the updated regional policy plan to try to encourage um, the development of good jobs and good paying jobs with benefits, those kinds of things. And we've had a number of discussions with the commissioners about that. It's very high priority for them. Um, we're also trying to tie um, the relationship of job creation to the need for affordable housing. And one of the new proposals for the updated regional plan will be um, a, a nexus requirement for uh, donations to affordable housing for projects that create low income jobs. Um, and that's new. We've never had it before. Um, we've always had an affordable housing set aside for um, residential projects, but we've never done, had it for a commercial projects. So I think that that's going to um, generate quite a bit of debate. And I think that's a healthy debate for us to have. Um, we, um, about a year ago, we hired um, um, a, a consultant to help us do a nexus study to see what is the relationship between the creation of, of low-wage jobs and the need for affordable housing. And he was able to document that, there, that, that there's, a, there's a link there. Um, there, are, there are programs like this in, in Boston and some other um, you know, metropolitan areas around the country, um, but we haven't tried it here before. So that's something that, that we're working on. Fred? Yes, and we talked a little bit about jobs as well and, and uh, the interest in, in better paying jobs and higher paying jobs and the lack of uh, those, many of those kinds of corporations here. Um, but it, one of the things that has seemed to be, we, we always talk about what we can bring in, what kinds of manufacturing or high tech jobs, um, but it also is, seems that it has to be uh, related to what the Cape is able to contribute, what mm -hmm. Cape Cod, the residents, the, the geography uh, are able to contribute uh, to, um, to the talent pool or to the basis, like mm -hmm. we talk about marine studies or, um, and, it's, and, and uh, we mentioned education in the past. Um, that seems to be at the hub of what in most communities where high paying jobs emanate from, particularly here in the Boston metropolitan area, and I think in many, many areas. And is, is there anything that the commission uh, is responsible for in terms of, uh, of trying to work toward having greater emphasis on higher education and areas of higher education that would particularly be important to the Cape to then go on to nurture uh, well-paying jobs? Mm -hmm. I don't think we have a direct role in that. Um, I think we do have an indirect role in that you know, it's, it's the role of government to try to um, set up the regulatory process so it encourages the right things in the right places, um, to provide the infrastructure to support those things. So part of that land use planning is related to what you're talking about. But in terms of direct um, you know, promotion of whether it's a business or an educational institution, that's not really our job. Any other questions? Oh, Mark? Mm. Let's see. I'm on. I'm on. OK. Um, to follow up on the, the economic development uh, side of things, you had made comment that you were working on some issues that would bring higher paying, better paying kinds of jobs. Can you elaborate on that and what kinds of jobs are you anticipating and what are you doing in order to facilitate these kinds of jobs coming to the Cape? There's, there's been a fair amount of work in, in the last few years um, through the um, Governor's Competitiveness Council and through the preparation of the um, Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy for Cape Cod um, in trying to identify what are the sort of clusters of different kinds of 
industries that might you know be successful here and um, that um, we're going to be um, including um, that discussion in, in the update of the regional plan. It includes the arts, it includes um, marine science, it includes, you know, um, healthcare and, and uh, industries like that. Um, I think our role here is that when we're reviewing projects, we're trying to encourage the ones that actually um, diversify the economy rather than simply um, giving us more of what we already have, which is basically a, you know, a, a service-based economy that is, you know, largely um, related to tourism. And that's a very important part, obviously, of our economy, and it's a, a part that, that will continue in the future, but it, it's, um, it, it typically produces jobs that are not well-paying jobs. So, you know, the, the, the idea is to try to diversify a bit, and again, you know, we can't do that directly. Um, we're a planning and regulatory agency. Um, you know, there are other agencies around whose job it is, like the Chamber, like the Economic Development Council, to provide more direct um, uh, assistance to businesses who want to locate here. But what we can do is to try to set up the, the, the planning and regulatory structure to create some places for these, these kinds of businesses to go um, and a permitting process that makes it um, reasonable for them to be able to go there. Uh, I mean, that, that's exactly what uh, businesses need. They need to know what the process is so that they can have a certain amount of transparency so that they know when they are planning that they can step through this process and know that it's going to happen in that particular manner without some kind of capriciousness that occurs mm -hmm. because of, I don't know, because of some, someone's wanting something to end up in a certain, with a certain vision. Um, so that, that transparency is absolutely necessary. We can see that there is definitely something different on one side of the bridge versus the other side of the bridge um, and what has occurred as far as jobs being promoted and brought to southeastern Massachusetts exclusive of Cape Cod and when you come over the bridge you know that there's something different happening and can you address that in any way or can you um, it can, address, can you somehow tie the work of the commission to how that's occurring? If you actually look at the numbers, if you compare, for example, uh, Barnstable County with Plymouth County, um, our rate of job growth and um, wage growth and um, the number of new businesses that have been created, actually are, we're ahead of Plymouth County. Um, and we, the, if you go to our website, there's actually, um, there's a, um, under the economic development section, there's a, there's a little um, presentation that Leslie Richardson, our economic development officer, put, put together with, with some of that data so you can, you can see how we compare with some of our neighbors. Um, I think we have been uh, more discriminating here on Cape Cod about the kind of economic development that we want. Um, we have a market that's already pretty saturated with retail development, and so we're trying to encourage some other kinds of things to happen here. Um, and but it's hard. I mean, this is um, we don't solicit certain businesses to come. You know, it, it's really it's a free market and. Um, what, what we have to sell here on Cape Cod is, is really the attractiveness of the place. It's a place where a business CEO might want to be. Um, but we have some dis natural disadvantages, you know, in terms of being um, a little hard to get to um, from a transportation perspective and kind of the end of the road. So, and as, as I think Fred um, alluded to, um, proximity to a major um, university or a series of universities uh, also tends to be an important uh, factor so that you have a, uh, a labor force that matches with the needs of whatever the, you know, the high-tech business is. Thank you. Are, there, are there any other questions for Marco? If not, Margo, thank you so much for coming over and um, bringing us up to date on what is happening with the 21st Century Report. Thank you. The uh
We'll go back now to um, an update of communications from the Board of County Commissioners. Um, they're all here today. Thank you all for coming. And um, Mark, um, Mark Zielinski is here also um, to uh, give us another um, financial 101 um, when the commissioners finish with their communicating. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, thank you. We, uh, again, uh, spend a lot of our time uh, talking today about human services and what the county's role should be in human services. That's something that the county commissioners will continue to focus on over the following months. We uh, summarized our ideas uh, along with the task force and other um, people who gave us implementations, I mean, input on what we thought uh, appropriate changes would be for the Cape Cod Commission. I think Margot gave you a good highlight of what the task force had asked. We added uh, some certain things to that took some of the things that uh, that they wanted kind of out so we have our own flavor of what we think the the commission should be doing we're going to try to finalize that next week and make that pre presentation to them uh, we continue to uh, to help you with the budget and make ourselves available if you have any questions uh, mark is going to give you a little report today going over some of the costs some of the numbers uh, gave some pretty good graphs on how that you know should summarize uh, the budget numbers to you. Bill has a quick uh, mention on household hazardous waste. Uh, the, uh, we have a, a household hazardous product collection on a regular basis. Uh, the ones that are planned in the near future, there's one this Saturday, April 21st in Sandwich, uh, one on June 16th in Falmouth, one on August 18th in Mashpee, and then uh, one on October 20th in Bourne. Uh, you can uh, bring uh, wood preservatives, gasoline, photo chemicals, uh, wood finishes, alkaloid, uh, lead, uh, marine auto paints, uh, solvents, the usual suspects to, to have some place to get rid of. These have been quite successful in the past and um, they're usually well received. So if uh, those towns, um, those that would be the place to go. And that's available on the website. Thank you. Any questions um, for the uh, commissioners? No, oh, you're getting off easy today. <laughs> yes, Mark is gonna Mark is gonna come up and make his presentation. <laughs> I hope I hope you'll stay. <laughs> I got mine. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for coming over, Mark. Um, thank, thank you, You and I had a little conversation um, a few days ago, and I thought that it would be um, good for Mark to come uh, back and, and go over the, specifically go over the reserves. There has been a great deal of discussion about the reserves, uh, what's in them, can they be um, can money be taken out of them? And so I asked him to come over and and bring us up to date once again with our financial 101. So thank well, you, Mark. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman. You're jumping the gun a little bit on my presentation, but that's all right. Um, what Charlotte didn't say is we had the pleasure of attending a, um, uh, a retirement party for Wally Lundstrom, who was the treasurer of uh, Yarmouth. And at the retirement party, they had these million dollar notes. And Charlotte and I grabbed some because we figured that's the best way to solve the budget crisis here. So um, we're going to submit those, and that'll take care of a lot of our issues. Um, but uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I actually had pre uh, prepared this presentation for our meeting of the, um, the hearing on the budget two weeks ago, but uh, we got crowded out. so. I wasn't able to deliver it, but um, I can do so now. And all of this is stuff that you've already seen um, going through the budget document. Won't be any news to you. Um, you know that the budget uh, for 08 is proposed to be 25 million, and it's a decrease of 6.3% uh, from the previous fiscal year. Um, the major expenditure areas, um, we actually uh, decreased salaries a little bit, and I have some uh, information on that. It was 
prepared the handout two weeks ago as well, but the question had come up is how did we, um, you know, where do we pare back some salary? So I have some information on that that I'm happy to share with you. Uh, group insurance, uh, health insurance went up. Actually, the rates went up about 15 or 16 percent on each of the plans this year, but they are proposing a, um, a premium holiday in the month of November, December. It's not quite clear um, to me, but so that should average out to be about a 10 percent uh, increase on health insurance. Um, retirement actually went down this year for us, and that's because of a cost shift really between us and the sheriff. Um, as you know, the way they allocate um, uh, retirement is based on payroll, and the, it just so happens that the sheriff's payroll is growing faster than ours. So some of the costs that get split between him and I get shifted to him a little bit. And the most important piece, of course, is all other areas, and that would be professional services and supplies and materials and all of those things. They had to go down uh, just over 15 percent. So. Um, I would uh, stress that there are um, deficiencies in the 08 budget in terms of the departments. Um, and um, from our, I think our perspective, that would be one of the areas um, that would be, we would be looking to fulfill if we were able to identify some funding going forward at some point in time. So um, the next two charts, of course, are out of the budget as well. One is the expenditures by group. And the expenditures one is notable because it, if you look at the salaries and wages and fringe benefits, you see that uh, those two things make up about 54% uh, of the total county budget. And that's pretty typical of how it's been over the past um, several years. The other thing I would no uh, make of note is the um, significant payment that we still make to the sheriff's department, the maintenance of effort. Um, it's about two and a quarter million dollars right now, so uh, it's a significant piece of, um, of our budget. Um, on the revenue side, again, the tax revenue piece, that's the county tax, the uh, Cape Cod Commission fund tax, as well as the taxes that we receive from the Registry of Deeds, and that has been the one that's in the news, of course, lately it, at the uh, 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 midpoint of fiscal 2007 on the deeds tax, we were down about 30 percent. We're a little bit better now. Through the end of March, we're down about 20 percent. Um, had a pretty good January, a not so good February, and a pretty good March. So um, um, right now, I'm projecting that we will finish the fiscal year 2007 with basically a balanced budget. We won't have to hopefully draw down any um, reserve funds, but. Um, of course, you never know if things turn south uh, for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, that may put it, put us in a difficult um, uh, financial position. And finally, as uh, Madam Speaker uh, mentioned, she asked me to speak today on the reserves. There's a lot of talk on reserves. Actually, John's not here. I don't think John Holman's here. He did a pretty good job at the meeting two weeks ago identifying kind of what we have and, and what's out there. Um, and this is a little, the chart's a little bit busy, but um, this is that $10 million that out th that's been sp spoken about many times out there. And just to go over it, most of our, that $10 million is committed to something. Um, currently, you see the statutory reserve there kind of tucked on the bottom in the middle. Um, we spent that, and we will hope to replenish it when we go into 2008, as we do at the end of each year. But currently, the 2007 one has been spent. That was spent on the fire training academy um, uh, incident that we had, the spill out there. Um, encumbrances, those are committed. Those are all our POs that are outstanding. Uh, continuing appropriations are projects that are started in one fiscal year, but for whatever reason, not completed and rolled into the next fiscal year. So those are all committed. And the capital fund offset, as you know, we've been uh, uh, offsetting any monies that we spend out of the capital fund with cash that we've had. So those are really all monies that have, have been um, uh, spent already. Um, and then, um, you know, we are using $805,000 in reserves for the fiscal year 08 budget. You see that on there. And um, of the up remaining two big pieces, one is the capital improvements um, fund that we had set aside. And um, I think most of you are aware, if you've talked to George and you've talked to John Blaisdell, that we're hoping to use a significant piece of that to do some improvements to the 
gym facility up so that we can relocate the health lab. Um, we're really pressed for space in the Superior Court building and we'll hope that will help out both the county's needs, the Cape Lake Compact's needs, um, and the court system's needs. They're pressed for space there as well. And then the other piece um, um, that I wanted to highlight on this is the stabilization fund. That's the bar graph you see on the um, on the um, on the right that represents that final slice. And those have been um, uh, we've been setting aside. We've set aside some legal reserve money, insurance reserve money. If you recall, we did an unfunded pension reserve allocation uh, at one point years ago. And then two small uh, reserves we have for salary and early retirement reserve. So um, that totals about $10 million at this point in time. They are still there. And again, as I had cautioned, uh, you know, if the rest of the fiscal 2007 um, holds the way it is, those reserve funds will be there as we start fiscal 2008. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Questions? Yes. Mark? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, where do we stand as of today as far as the 2007 revenues versus expenditures? Are we in a surplus? Are we even? Or are we looking at deficit? Um, right, in, if we, uh, right now, as of, say, the end of March, we were still behind. We were about 20% behind on the deeds tax, and we were behind. The projection was still a negative number if we were to close the year at, on March 31st. But I'm projecting over the next uh, three months that we'll close that negative gap and we'll end the year with a, a, a zero um, uh, remaining on the, on the, on the balance. After setting aside all the all the reserves that you see identified here, okay. Uh, what is that in a real number, a real dollar number? Is, you're saying, you're saying we're, it would be zero. Saying? The bottom line on the on the on the general fund would be uh, after setting aside these reserves, be zero. There'd be nothing left over, no surplus, no anything like that. No anything like that. But as we stand today, you're saying we're 20 percent of which number of the overall budget? We're 20 percent of the seven. Uh, 20 percent of the I think it was 8.2 million dollars that we had um, budgeted for a revenue for fiscal 2007 out of the deeds tax revenue. So about 1.6 million at this point in time were short going on this year. That's correct. Working on That's 2007. right. That's correct. Okay. Um, the the 805,000, I, I think that's the number you used, mm -hmm. that uh, that's being pulled from reserves to use for 2008. Correct. Okay. So that that is already being press forward. Let's to Correct. Set aside to use next year. Okay. Right. That's what I wanted to understand. Thank you. Okay. And yet, oh, I saw Ron's hand first and then okay. Fred. Yeah, I'd just like to follow up on that, Mark. Um, the, the pie chart shows you where this money has been in sense or what it's dedicated to. The money put into the fiscal year 08 budget, it, it, it tells you where it's going, but it doesn't tell you where it's coming from. In other words, what where, where's that 8%? Where's that? How is that money generated that is now going to be used for the 08 budget? Well, right now, I, I, right now I've just set aside a line item, then I put $805,000 in it. And assuming that the projections that I'm going off of hold true, that 805000 will be there remaining in the reserves to balance next year's budget. I would say, Ron, actually in previous years we were using about a million and a half. So that has come down substantially in terms of money left over to fund next year's uh, projects. So, so what you're saying is that you've, you've raised that much more money in the last fiscal year so that you have $800,000 left over for the next fiscal year? Well, we'll have to take it out of, uh, out of, out of the reserves. Don't forget, before prior years we had growth management reserves, we had the estuary reserve, we had a lot of other reserves that we were able to set aside, and this year we weren't able to set those aside. I, I guess my question is, you keep saying you're taking it out of reserves, but I, I haven't figured out how they how it got into the reserves. You say, well, we put it in the reserves and then we take well, it out of the reserves, but I wonder where it came from. Well, I guess I guess the answer is over the past I don't know eight years, 1999 um, through the present, we've worked you know long and hard, I guess, on reaching a balance where we've set money aside 
um, to uh, as, as a rainy day fund, I guess, as, as it, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and the balance has been, you know, we've used some money. We've used money for wastewater. We've given money back to the towns. We've used money for human services. But we've also been able to set money aside. And this is the first year, really 2007, where some of that money that we had set aside we're not able to keep in its place anymore. But that's 805000 that so far we are able to so keep that's there. that's the rainy day fund. It wasn't dedicated to anything else. It was, it was in reserves. That's correct. Right. That piece of it. Okay. Fred? And I guess the, the question then, Mark, is if in fact we were to look at trying to take $100,000 out of that 805 and be left with $705,000. No, that's not correct. Then you if you took 100,000 out of that 805, your budget is out of balance by 100,000. The budget for 2008. That's correct. You you're spending $100,000 more and actually because you'd be adding it to your expenditures you'd be spending two hundred thousand dollars more okay all right uh, but I, I was really uh, wondering about legal reserve the five percent which is what about five hundred thousand dollars yeah i think it's six hundred thousand six i think it said six percent does it say six it says five percent i'm sorry yes okay um what is that i'm that money is sitting in a, a reserve fund for correct or what um, any legal costs that may be due to the county, any, if we're subject to suit, if we're, um, um, uh, any lawsuits that we may, we may be subject to, that was one of the reserves that we had set aside. A legal reserve, the insurance reserve, those two reserves. Is that a statutory or does it have to do with guidelines, Mark, state guidelines or? No, it's, no, it, there, there, no, it's basically reserves that we have set aside. Um, uh, as a financial surety, really, um, to protect the county in the event of uh, some type of legal or insurance incident. Thank you. Tom? Um, I'm still a little stuck on where the 805000 comes from. Is, is, it, is, that, uh, is that reserve now zeroed out? Is that what you're saying? At, on, on July 1st, when the budget is in effect, assuming it gets passed, then that one would be zeroed out because it would be in effect appropriated to use. Right, but right now eight. it's right. Right now it's it's 805. Correct. And you're using all of it in 208. Correct. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, now the procedure for tapping the reserve, should someone want to do that, uh, I just mentioned the legal reserve. If someone wanted to go in and take 50 grand out, is it? Um, within the power of the legislature do that through an amendment to say I'd like to reduce line item reserve account blah 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 by 50,000 to 550 is that um, the way we would structure that within the budget? Since you'd be planning on spending it you'd have to go through an appropriation process which is an ordinance process. And the budget being an ordinance does the budget cover that ordinance process? So you could do that through the budget process certainly. Now, the, uh, the, the other question I have was on the interest income. Um, last year, we expended 145000 This year, we're expending 245000 Not expending. That's a revenue. So we're expecting getting that in. How is it that we're earning an additional $100,000 over last year when it looks like we have less money? Actually, our cash balance, though, is still strong. It, I've been, we've been, we do a, cash, a quarterly cash report to the state. And um, our cash balance actually has been very strong, so that's the reason for that. So, so is the two forty-five off of the cash balance? That's correct. Yep. How is are the reserves counted as cash balance? They're part of that cash balance, yes, in the general fund. Yep. But it, but any so it's not like the um, legal reserve would get its ten percent and it goes up by sixty thousand. No, it just goes into the. And these are all general fund items. They just come out of the general fund. Thank you. Fred? Mark. Uh, yeah, Mark. Uh, this is $10 million. About $10 million, yeah. yep. The work comp is 1%. That's $100,000. Is that, are, is the county self-insured for work comp? We are self-insured. We do have an excess policy. And as you know, with insurance over the past few years. When does it click in? 
<laughs> That's the problem. It clicks in about, I think our attachment point is now 525. Used to be 185. We had Five, a really good... 525,000? Correct, per occurrence. One death case and your 100,000 is gone. Uh, it's, well, <laughs> You don't have to argue with me, Fred. I, I, I know. That's skinny as hell. It is right now. Luckily, I think, I, I won't say luckily. I would say on the county side, we're very conscientious about our workers' comp. We, we manage it, I think, pretty well. Um, so we've, we've never had expenditures go out of workers' comp that we've threatened that 100000 Let's put it that way. Any other questions from anybody? Mark, do you have a question? Okay. Yes, Madam Speaker, thank you. Um, the budget's going to, it's off by, it's down, decreased by 6.3% of last year, or the pres this present year. Um, so that's about $1.6 million a year. Yeah, 1.7, I think, yes. 1.6. And so the reserve of 805000 is roughly half of that. That's, it's making up for half of that debt. Or is that on top? That's what I'm trying to. So you've got you've calculated 100, 805,000 into the budget. That's right. You still have this 100. One, and it's still going down. That's so correct. If you didn't have this reserve fund. If you didn't have the reserve, it'd go down another 800,000. That's what I wanted. Yes, that's the point I wanted to get across. Okay, so we would be in for 204. You have to cut another 800,000 out of your yeah. budget, right? That's okay. That's what I wanted to understand. Thank you. Yes, right. Um, I think we all know your position in terms of uh, the assembly uh, potentially not touching reserves, but I'm I don't have a position, Ray. Yeah, well, you know that. I just that's the facts, ma'am. I'm going to put you on the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> of these reserves, could you identify ones which you would feel would be less controversial? Uh, from your I financial would, perspective. From my financial, okay, I'll put my finance hat on. I, I, I go back to what I had said earlier. We've, you know, we worked long and hard um, trying to uh, build up the uh, financial surety of the county. Uh, we included it in the last um, the uh, voter approved um, charter that we did, which gave us the ability to do um, uh, the receipts we res reserve for appropriation, which are those that I talked about, the stabilization fund and the capital improvements fund. And um, I think from a financial management perspective, you want to have a, uh, a decent level of reserves. You don't want an excess level of reserves, and I don't think we have an excess level of reserves. Um, from a financial and fiduciary perspective, um, do we have enough? No, of course not. We never have enough. Um, it's like insurance. It's never there's never enough, um, but I think we we do have a decent level of reserves right now. Um, uh, if you if you you have to kind of look at it from you can't really call the committed ones those encumbrances continuing pro you really can't call those reserves they're all committed to something. So that's why I think John had indicated last time that the stabilization fund is really your rainy day fund there um, that you have left and. Um, uh, that's about a million eight on a $25 million budget. I think we figured that out was 7%. Um, I think most entities, if they thought, would, if they were asked, was that enough of a reserve level to maintain as an operating reserve, they'd say no, because they're looking at probably, what, two, three months operating reserves. Um, so, that, you know, that's the, uh, that's the issue we face. It's a a tug versus you know the needs that are out there, which we recognize. But I'd also argue, you know, there's other needs that have been identified uh, through the county budget process that you didn't hear about two weeks ago. And the departments have a lot of needs. Their budgets really were cut beyond the bone, as as I think most of you know, in reviewing them. Um, wastewater has come up as a need. So, you know, we had to strike a balance. Um, it's a hard balance to strike. It doesn't make a lot of people happy. Um, you can tell how successful you are by how many people are mad at you. So, um, I guess we were pretty successful this year. So, um, so you know, I, I guess that's the best I can do okay. answering that okay. question. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Quest Gray. Gray. Ron? I, I don't want to beat to death this 8% this on the budget, but I'm, I'm going to have to try to figure it out because it's spinning around in my head. You, you said we used $1.2 million for fiscal year 07 from reserves? Um, 1.5, I think. 1. But we might have we might have we might have dropped it from to 1.2. All right. Now is that is that 
a carryover? In other words, was, was there a pool of money and you used 1.5 last year and now you're using another 800,000 this year? It was a carryover from the previous fiscal year. So yes. there was 2,300, there was 2,300,000 in there and you used part of it last year and part of it this year? Um, well, we try to replenish it every right. year. So what so. we're saying is you used one point, let's say 1.5 last year right. and as a result of that, you now have come up with an excess of 800,000, so you've suffered a loss of 700,000. It's, it's not an excess, it's out of the reserve structure itself, which is kind of a moving target, and that's why it's kind of hard right. to yeah, understand. But, but I'm wondering if, in, in, in response to the question of the representative from Orleans, whether you can consider that 800,000 a total expenditure when in a sense it is, it is a carryover. In other words, you spent 1.5, you took, last year's budget was juiced by $1.5 million of reserves. All right, so if the shortfall is 800,000 at the end of this year, then, then you have to say that the shortfall is the difference between the 800,000 and the, and the, the 1.5 going in. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, not at all. <laughs> no, you lost me on that right. one. Oh. No, the right, well. the, I mean, the, 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 real, the, the real shortfall is what you think you're going to get in revenues, and you add up all, these, you know, all the numbers, and those are on, I forget what page they're on. Um, but and and you come up with a number, and then we have to try to make the budget fit within that number, and we look at all of our expenditures. And actually, this year, most of the departments didn't come back with uh, any new uh, uh, initiatives at all. This year, um, they were tempered by you know the speeches I had given given them during the budget process, and so there wasn't really anything new in there. But even kind of a um, um, a um, uh, level of service budget um, that they identified for us with the commissioners, we had to cut a million seven out of because that's even using eight hundred and five thousand out of our reserves to balance to to fold that into the revenue mix. We only had uh, twenty five million dollars left um, uh, in terms of revenues. To match with expenditures. That's why we had to cut a million seven from the level of budget that the departments would have requested from us, and that does include the, um, you know, all the all the things that the departments wanted to do. So, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions, Fred? Please. Quickly, um, ten million. A ten million, yes. Uh, where I come from, reserves are unencumbered. These are all encumbered except for the two percent. Statutory. Uh, mm, no, not not quite. Uh, most of them are. We'll let's call them committed. We'll call them committed. And really, what's not committed, I would call the stabilization fund. But I hate to use the word uncommitted because we've identified, you know, that we've using these for legal reserve and insurance reserve and blah blah blah. But are they fungible? Yeah, you could say they're fungible. Makes me nervous. Um, it makes me nervous, Fred. I'm always nervous. Fred. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, just back to one other item that we didn't we haven't talked about which is the capital improvements uh, budget of 19 percent uh, now that has those dollars have not been committed via purchase orders or that's correct they have not although we have an ongoing process um, right now which we are working on um, to identify what it would cost to do the health lab relocation to the gym okay that's what we're working on right now so, so that that is uh, beyond the stabilization fund or pieces of stabilization. That is also a budget that um, an amount of money could be taken out of without a small amount. It was. It, it's change. something we are planning on proposing in the very, very near future. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, George. Thank you, Mark. Mark, how do you keep this money? Not in a savings account. Uh, basically, George, we do. We're limited by mass general uh, laws in what we can. I can't. I can't put it in hedge funds, and I can't put it on real estate or a, no, but a hard uh, eight. Uh, CDs or what? Uh, you, and, don't, uh, you don't have it. We have a collateralized account, and actually, um, the assistant treasurer Joanne Nelson was very happy recently. I think she said we were doing about five 
percent or so. I think we were beating Wally at the Armouth, so that's how we'd gauge it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Mark, I know that we roll the capital expenditures into the operating budget. In other words, facilities, when they present their operating budget, it includes capital improvements, correct? That's correct. All right. How does that, does that draw upon the capital improvements reserve that's here? Um, uh, no, it does not. We set aside the other capital fund offset money to cover any expenditures in the capital fund for that current fiscal year. Any more questions for, yes, Tony. Hey, Mark. Hey, Tony. Um, I don't know if you just said something that I didn't clearly understand. I didn't understand it, so. Yeah, probably, <laughs> yeah. two of us. I guess there's a lot of things that people don't understand at the moment. The continuing appropriations for projects that we've given money to or set money aside for, right. those are for projects that we've approved over the course of the last several years that have money withdrawn every year. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Um, the capital improvement is, just, is basically the same thing. Money that we're anticipating if we're going to do this project or that project, we have the money set aside in that 19%. Is that right? Um, no. The ca continuing appropriation ones are already appropriated, it's things that have already gone through the budget process. The continuing, the capital improvements one is, hasn't, that, that's not the case with. Okay. So there, when you say that in the near future you're hoping you can do something with that, does that indicate that there's a possibility that if we make it through June 30th with the funds we have available and, as you said earlier, uh, May, June, and July, May and June, and they just don't completely become a catastrophe in our revenues, is there a possibility that there could be some money the first part of July that's available that will be available out of that fund? And the other question that I've asked before, and I'm not sure that I've gotten an answer, on the continuing appropriations, uh, is there money that we have encumbered for projects that there's a possibility the projects will not continue? Or is that those are just projects that will absolutely positively need to spend that money? No, I've reviewed that list pretty thoroughly. And because, you know, especially uh, when we were going through the first half of 2007, things were pretty dire. We were really down. We were down 30% through the first half. So we were looking all over the place for um, whatever we could find, wherever we could find it. Um, um, and I've gone through that list pretty thoroughly. And most of those things are needed and necessary. And there's not, uh, there's really nothing in there that I can say, well, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. That would free up some money. So, um, no, most of the money that's in, in identified in that is really things that are ongoing. Um, one of the ones that uh, was in there, a good example, is the elevator that we did at the um, second district court and the, and the handicap ramp. Those were things that had uh, taken multiple years but didn't, you know, usually the continuing appropriation one is it just doesn't have a, an encumbrance behind it. We're not at the point where you're ready to put the PO down and say that's the vendor that's going to be doing that or that's the thing you're buying for that particular thing. So that's really the difference on those. I guess, you know, the question has come up for your first question about, you know, whether there would be some kind of process that we would go through. Um, next year, I think that's kind of up to the assembly and the commissioners to determine on what money would be available and when, if there were some available. Okay. So there is there is a possibility as long as things don't completely die with uh, in the next three in April, May, and June. And the other question, I guess, I, I, I would like to ask is, if if things do get worse instead of better over the course of the next two and a half months, do we have a problem with the eight hundred and five thousand that we have set aside for the 08 budget? Well, it depends on how bad that circumstance gets. But yeah, it's potentially you could have that kind of issue that we'd face. I don't foresee it, but yeah, you could. You certainly could. Well, you don't foresee it because you're hoping you're guessing right. You always plan for the worst and hope for the best, is I guess, is what we're trying to do. Thank you, Mike. Ray, did you have something? Yeah. Um, you allude to some other programs or initiatives that did make it in the 08 budget that you would have liked to have funded. I think that would be useful for us to hear. You know, no, actually, I think I said that the, the, the departments really didn't ask for any new initiatives this year. I had 
going to, I usually tell them that if you don't ask, you're not going to get. But this year it was really, we knew kind of going in, we were going to have a hard time with 08. So they didn't really, you know, take the time to do, you know, the vetting of new initiatives. So really what we were cutting was kind of the, um, the uh, normal funding levels. Uh, we cut those out of their budget is really what they, what we did. So. Any further questions of Mr. Zielinski? Hearing none, thank you very much, Mark, for, thank you. for coming. Madam Speaker, on behalf of Bill and Mary and myself, we want to thank Mr. Boardman. He presented us with uh, some books to read this past week, Banker to the Poor, so we look forward to, to reading those. And uh, if, if anybody else has gifts, we're glad to take them. But thank you, Mark. We appreciate it. I'd like to... Uh, um, point out that that's only for the first installment of those three books going to the county commissioners. Each of you will be receiving a copy in short order. It's just a matter of timing and trying to get things done. So <laughs> I look forward to handing those out and hoping that you'll enjoy reading them because I believe there's a really good seed of an idea in there. Thank you, Thank you Mark. <laughs>